Well, welcome back. This is going to be session three of component three, and we're going to we're going to uh, move into welfare economics and a description of some of the economic foundations to what we're we're talking about um, for benefit cost analysis. As you can tell, I'm in a different room, so I'm probably going to turn the wrong way on everything because everything's inverted from the way it was before. I have some readings posted up here. And I'll make a, a readings list as well, and it's going to be uh, uh, in a folder in under Component 3 on the web CT. Um, I'm going to add to this. The readings I told you that you're going to be doing on, on, uh, for the rest of this course, I'm going to hand, hand pick and hand feed them to you. Um, the, the first one is, is, a, is a very uh, nice little uh, description of benefit cost analysis by a gentleman named uh, Paul Portney. And it's, it's in a, a resource, and I just thought I'd put it up here anyway to, so that, and, and show it to you. It's in a resource called the, the, con, it's the Concise Economics Library. And let's see if this thing opens up. And it did. Or the Library of, yeah, it's called the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics. Um, and it's got a series of contributors. And it's, got a, it's, it's, a, it's a limited amount of, of information. They tend to be a page or two or three. But um, they give you a nice introduction to different types of concepts in economics. And so I thought this one might be, be useful. Um, he has a nice piece here on, on uh, benefit cost analysis. I think it's, it's a good summary. It's a good uh, um, description of, of some of the issues. And, and it covers some of perhaps what I might have done in my lecture. So you can take a look at that, and, and you'll find that to be, to be, to be useful. Um, I'm going to close that. And the Garrett and Leatherman piece in the Web Book of the Regional Sciences that you were reading for the fiscal impact uh, assessment, it does have a chapter on benefit cost analysis. You can get to that, of course, at the Web Book of the Regional Sciences. Um, chapter 5 is on benefit cost analysis. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a relatively straightforward um, chapter uh, it, it's 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 um it's uh um more of a how to type of thing than 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 a uh than a um uh, a broad based description of 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 benefit cost analysis they call it cost benefit analysis um i always call it benefit cost analysis because it's benefits divided by the costs is how you determine whether you're going to fund something um, but historically, the, the, the phrase had been cost-benefit analysis. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a reasonably good um, and, and concise reading. You can get through it relatively rapidly. It's not very long. And again, it's going to give you a good foundation. If you look at this stuff, and then it will supplement the notes that I'm, I'm providing you here. Lastly, there's a piece here, and I thought I'd post it as well on public goods because I, in a little bit here in welfare economics I'm going to be talking about public goods and it's written by a, a relatively well-known economist who comes from a different um, school of economics than, than, than perhaps I, I adhere to and, and it's by a gentleman named Tyler Cohen but he has a description of what are, what constitute public goods. Um, this gentleman comes from a much more libertarian bend, and so he uses the words supposedly and purportedly. But he does try very very hard to describe what public goods are, and I've, I've just put that up there so you can maybe just get a gander at uh, how how he might characterize public goods and contrast his comments and 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 points of view versus how I deal with this. I, it, it's worth, it's worth a, um, a, a, a quick discussion here. We're moving into something called welfare economics. And welfare economics argues that there's right and proper roles for government to act in support of people's well-being and welfare beyond just the big things like national defense and and floods and security, things like that. But that there are right and proper ways for government to participate in the economy in that the, the leverage, the power, the capacity, and the wisdom of government and deliberations can produce 
economically efficient outcomes for society. Well, welfare economics argues that. Libertarians will lean much more towards that we would want to minimize government activity and we want the government to do the least possible versus perhaps the most possible. And by doing the least possible, we search for private market solutions to nearly everything. And they would argue that, that private associations or private arrangements or private agreements are satisfactorily, satisfactory for all manner of things that we currently rely on our governments for. For, for the provision of fresh water, for the, for the housing and the supervision of prisoners, for fire protection, um, for all manner of things that we have come to traditionally rely on our governments to provide, many libertarian points of view would say, no, you know, the private sector can do that much more effectively, much more efficiently using market principles and competition to provide the service um, to or for government or for associations rather than government providing the service directly. And so what we've had over the years is sort of a, an emerging mix. You might have, when I, I'm, a, I was, I'm a veteran and when I was a soldier, um, in, in, in back in the 1970s, early 1970s, um, you had cooks and you had you had all manner of soldiers who did soldier things, which 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 might in, might have involved cleaning and and maintenance and all kinds of different things and cooking and and stuff like that. Now in the modern army and modern military, they have decided that, well, you know, a lot of that stuff, we really don't need our soldiers doing that, and our airmen and our, and our, and our sailors and our Marines. We can just hire that out. We can, we can hire cooks, and we can hire janitors, and we can hire maintenance personnel, and, and have private contractors take care of that kind of stuff, and leave the soldiers, sailors, and Marines and air, 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 air personnel to do their stuff. And so we get that kind of a, of a thing. Instead of the, a, a college, for example, where I am having janitors, perhaps some colleges have hired janitorial services to come and take care. So libertarians would argue that the private sector does it more efficiently, more effectively, and that we should minimize government's role. Um, welfare economists or Keynesians, people like me, believe that governments play an important role in the economy and the truth is obviously somewhere between the two because that's, those are kind of the dimensions that we move back and forth in as we, as we, we uh, uh, develop public policy here in the United States. So this session, session three, I'm just going to label these sessions one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and, and not get goofy. And if it bugs you that I've la labeled everything differently, that's okay, you'll get over it. Session three is on welfare economics. Benefit cost analysis is merely applied welfare economics. And, and, and in, in welfare economics, um, it, it helps give us the underlying foundations and the bases for, for, for what we're doing. And welfare economics begins with the market the private market, capitalism as we know it, the, the system of private exchanges of goods and services for money. And in the production of private goods, the theories of capitalism assume many things that really don't hold up very well in reality, but we assume that we have a competitive market, that, 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 the, that, that, that firms are competing with each other to provide goods to consumers and that that process of competition in and of itself is producing higher value goods at a lower delivered price continuously over the duration of that competition process. And in a competitive market then there are no monopoly profits being made. Now we know that companies make what are called monopoly profits or excess profits. You're the first in, you've got a patent. Um, and, and over, a, over, over, a, over a, uh, a period of time, perhaps you make monopoly profits. But in the long run, in the long run, your profit margins shrink. And as a, as a system becomes competitive, there are no opportunities for monopoly profits. And you have uh, 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 an efficient number of producers providing an efficient number of goods. 
that are demanded by consumers at as low a price as possible. So we assume that there are no monopoly profits that are being made. We assume that consumers have full knowledge both of the value of the product they're buying and of the alternative. So we assume a rational and informed consumer. And you and I both know that is also oftentimes a fallacy. We, we become smart over time. Oftentimes we make mistakes. We buy the wrong thing. We buy the wrong type of shoe. We buy all kinds of things um, because we don't know what some of the choices are that are out there. Or we make the wrong conclusions about whether something suits us right. Nonetheless, over time, we have knowledge and we have knowledge of alternatives. I, have, I, I know that if, if, if I buy, if I spend $4 on this hamburger, I can evaluate whether that's a, a better deal than spending $4 on, on a couple of bean burritos. I can, I can evaluate that, and I know that I have choices and alternatives in, 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 in my economy. And finally, that the prices that I pay uh, for the products that I purchase, they, were, they were reflect something called my utility. And my utility is my satisfaction. My satisfaction is my happiness. And my happiness equates to the cost that I paid. The price equals my utility. And or how my value is the price that I pay. And, and were it not, I wouldn't pay the price. And so that's the paradox of it. So we begin with, with the private market. And let me, let me I've got my, um, my uh, mouse up here too. But this is, this is your, your traditional um, demand and supply curve that you see in economics. And, and you have a demand curve that, that slopes downward from left to right. And you have a supply curve that slopes upward from left to right. And then you have these elements. And you can, you can read this. And I'm going to talk about it. But what we have is P stands for price. And Q stands for quantity. So when we're looking at this, when we're looking at this, this tells me at what price will what quantity of an item be produced. As the price goes up, here, let me, let me change this to a marker. We'll make it a felt tip pen. So let's say as the price of something goes up for one reason or other up to P1, then that sends a signal to the market to produce more of this commodity. And it will try to produce more and come alive. Here it is. And it'll try to produce Q amount of that commodity. And, and so we would, we would get then this much of that commodity being produced at this price. But because you have more people entering into the market producing that quantity, the supply goes up. And if the supply goes up, you've sent a signal to produce more at that higher price. But because the supply goes up, it's going to make the amount of, of good that's produced tend back towards, to tend back towards Q which is the, the point at which it's in equilibrium. So at, at, at the original Q, Q1, we'll get it here. Let me find it. I'm having trouble with this seeing it. Let's see if, there it is, way over there. OK. At Q1, at, if, if this is all that's being produced at Q1, it can command this price. But because this price is sending a signal to the market to increase production, it's going to want to, again, increase production until it brings the price down because the more the supply is. Nonetheless, what you end up with then in a traditional supply-demand curve is price and quantity are in what we would call equilibrium. They're in equilibrium. Now, I'm going to enter uh, on one more thing here. I'm going to extend this thing all the way up. And then I'm going to change my thing to a, 
uh, a highlighter. And what's going to happen here is that at equilibrium, where price and quantity are in balance, we're sending the right kind of signal to the economy, then we have something up here. The, this is called, I'm just going to color all of this. Just take me a second. All of this area now that is, is yellow, all of this area now that is yellow is the, the, the sum of the value of all of the, of the products that are produced. P times Q is the value. But what we call this, this yellow stuff, it's called the consumer surplus. It's the value that people place on this good, whether at just one unit of production and somebody is willing to pay a very high price, or at the optimal level of production, Q, where we're all paying this price. And, and so this is our traditional, our traditional um, supply-demand graph. Now, what we get when, 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 we, when we're in equilibrium, when, when, um, when price and, and quantity are, are where they're supposed to be, then marginal value equals marginal cost, or my utility equals the cost. And if that's the case, um, I'm said to be in, in equilibrium. And the quantity of private good demanded by the consumers will be equal to the quantity supplied by the producers. And, and my market is in balance. And that's the characteristics of market and market equilibrium. So we're going we're gonna to move out. Now, when this is the case, we have something called Pareto optimality. And that's just after an economist. But, but something is considered to be Pareto optimal when everything in, is in balance. And it means that no more improvements can be made in the market. That, that we've, got, we've got a perfect solution in terms of supply, demand, price. Everything is in balance. Um, the consumers are unwilling to purchase any more of a good or any less of another good at some price or supply level. We are in balance. We're buying what we, what we want. And it's equivalent to market equilibrium. The market is in equilibrium. It implies economic efficiency and that the market is supplying the appropriate mix of private goods and services at appropriate prices. Now, I want to think about this rather than looking at a graph. Let's think about this. I am in a corn producing state. And let's assume we have a bumper record harvest of corn. So what do we have? We have we have this huge supply of corn. Now, worldwide or national demand for corn very well may not have been sending any signals to grow more corn. It's just that Mother Nature was good to us, and we have all this corn. Well, because we have all of this corn, we've got to get rid of it. We've got to get rid of it. You can store it, and you can wait, but then you can't store it too long because you've got next year's crop coming in, and you've got, you got bills to pay. But you've got a large supply. Well, but the, but the demand is only at, at a certain level. And if the demand's at only a certain level, it's, gonna, it's only going to want to buy so much corn at a certain price. And if you have an oversupply of corn and you're saying to somebody, buy more of my corn, well, then the price is going to go down. The price has to go down um, for people to buy more than what they would want. And as that supply of corn starts to shrink, as we get towards the end of the, what's called the crop year and the carryover stocks um, and all of the uses have been allocated and we get a sense of the kinds of stocks that are out there, perhaps the price of corn goes up. And, and, and then the price, again, reflects the amount of supply relative to current uses for corn. We've had the very same things happen to us with regard to energy. Um, a year ago in 2008, or you can think back to 2008, in the middle of 2008, Gasoline prices climbed to four dollars. At a very high level, how did people respond? They responded by demanding, being willing to buy less gasoline. They bought less gasoline. So at the high price, the quantity that people could buy had to go down. At the high price, the quantity that people could buy had to go down. But at the high price, everybody and their brother who was producing any kind of energy, whether in Oklahoma or North Dakota or Wyoming or, 
or anywhere out of there, tar sands up in Canada was producing because the market had been rising, 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 raising price. They had increased, remember, the quantity that they were willing to produce. And so they were pushing as much oil as they could onto the world market at that extremely high price because they wanted to capture that high price. They wanted that price. They wanted their good or their commodity to be bought at that very, very high price. And we had a huge supply, but we had a huge price. And then we saw the prices start to come down for a variety of reasons, not the least of which was the recession. But we saw the price come down. Now we have this incredible oversupply of energy. And because of the recession and the realization that, that, that the world's economy wasn't going to expand rapidly, the, the, the prices collapsed. And here we are with a huge supply and very, very low prices. Well, and eventually with very low prices and a large supply, people start to consume more because it's cheap to burn gasoline. And so we go back and forth and back and forth. And that's how the market clears, himself, clears itself. So uh, Pareto optimality is equivalent to market equilibrium. It applies economic efficiency. Economic efficiency means the market can't be made any better. Um, it's a supplying the appropriate mix of private goods and services at the right prices. So that's the market. And the market's supposed to work. And as you know full well, if you're looking at the current uh, economic mess we're in, um, the market fails. Um, but there are three categories of market failures besides recessions and, and poor government oversight that I want to talk about here. And the first one, which relates, by the way, to that Tyler Cowen um, little piece in, in the economics encyclopedia, is on public goods. There are many market failures, but um, I'm, I'm going to talk about what constitutes market failures. And the first one are public goods. And the second is something called externalities. And externalities are a very notable type of market failure that, that almost compel government action. And then the last one is something called natural monopolies. And while I'm going to describe it, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about natural monopolies. Um, they're just one of the categories that legitimizes government action. With regard to benefit cost analysis, though, um, it, it has application and, and it's important, but um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on natural monopolies. OK, let's first off start out with public goods. A public good is distinguished from a private good. A private good is, is rival. And it's exclusive. If, if I choose the hamburger for lunch, then that comes at the, it's, I'm rivaling the choice of my two burritos. So that's my rival. Okay, so, so I, it's rivalrous. It's, it's, I've got choices between this and this. And, and in general, given how I'm feeling, I might be very happy one day eating my hamburger and very happy another day eating my two burritos. Those might be my two choices, and it's rivalrous. There's, there's competition between, between the goods. There's competition between a, a Buick and a Chevy, and there's competition between a, a Sony and an RCA, and there's, there's competition between Coke and Pepsi. It's rivalrous. A private good is also exclusive. If, if I buy it for my use, then you can't take it and use it. If I eat my hamburger, you can't eat it. If I drink my Pepsi, you can't drink it. So it's, it's exclusive. If it's for me, if I use it, you can't use it. It's not out there for everybody else to use. Once I take it, it's mine. So my use does not, so public goods are different. They're the opposite. My use of something does not deter others from using it. It is non-rival and non-exclusive. The most notable example is, is national defense. My use of the United States's defense service does not limit your use of it. And you, you, it's hard to distinguish your use. But the easy ones are clean air. If I'm breathing clean air, it doesn't prevent you from breathing clean air if, 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 or water. Um, um, or, or the safety I receive from a dam from flood control. My, 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 my receipt 
of the benefit of flood control does not detract, if you're in the same situation that I am, from the benefit that you're leading. I can't use up all the flood control benefits. I can't use them up. I'm, I, it's, it's so, I, we can't divide it up. We can't chop it up. We can't, we can't sell it. Now, there are things that are, are like that, they're, that, are, are, that, that, that are in the private sector that are like public goods, meaning, meaning I can't control who buys or uses my, 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 my commodity. And television and radio signals are an example where they can't control they can't control, and they effectively can't price. I'm talking about airways. They can't price the receipt of the signal. They can't pr price a house when I'm a kid growing up watching Captain Kangaroo. They can't price that. So the signal, we call it free TV because it, it's, it's, it is non-rival and it's non-exclusive. If you got bunny ears, you could receive Captain Kangaroo. And if you don't know who Captain Kangaroo is, that's too bad. Um, but I do, and that's okay. Now we have two types of public goods. So public goods are the kinds of goods then that the market's not going to supply because it can't, it can't commodify them, it can't put them in a box, it can't define them as a specific bounded service to sell to you. I cannot sell you clean air and exclude that clean air from somebody else. I can't do that in my market. Um, um, or, I, or I ethically can't do that. Okay, so public goods are, are goods that have to be provided because the market won't provide them, because the market has no mechanism for cataloging, quantifying, and pricing the commodity and delivering that commodity precisely to the consumer at the exclusion of those who would not pay for it. So that's what a public good. We have two types of public goods. The first type, of course, are the reasons we have government. Pure public goods, national defense, public safety, the law enforcement and the fire protection services, um, clean water, clean air, much like the examples that I first started with. Those are pure public goods. They are the, with the province of government to provide. Then we have another category, and as we evolve over time, we have something that we call merit goods. And these are things that we have determined as a society, both these are value judgments as well as reasoned determinations, that they are things that we ought to consume. And there's something called non-merits goods or that are things that we ought not consume. And merit goods, they give rise to um, the public provision of excludable services and goods in society. Um, in these instances, society has determined that the market, by excluding, excluding access to certain goods, is either dangerous or socially or ethically intolerable. And we could think in terms of, of education. Education is a great example. Um, there's no reason in the world why education can't be provided in the United States by private providers. And that means that you would be able to buy, relative to your wealth, more or better education. Um, you, you, if you were of modest means, you could buy modest education. If you were wealthy means, you could buy a, you know, an excellent and a, and a much more dynamic and enriched education. And if you were poor and you couldn't afford it, well, tough. We've excluded you. The market could do this. Well, we've determined in our society that public education is a merit good, that up to some level, public education is a, basically a superior good. It's a merit good. It's something that a, 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 a uh, modern society needs, a mandatory public education, public education systems. Well, of course, we have private schools, and we have, we have charter schools, and we have mixes of this and that, but the hallmark of, of American society is public education. And so it's a merit good. Even though it could be sold and bartered in the market, it's exclusionary um, in, in an intolerable way because it excludes people based on, on, on income. And, and as such, it's, it's intolerable. Um, the same thing for vaccinations. If you have the money to pay for vaccinations, the drug companies could just provide vaccinations at a price 
that that the market will pay for. So if you can afford to get flu shots and and swine flu shots and smallpox, that's all fine and good. You got your shots. And those folks who don't get those those shots, well, you know, life is tough. Okay, but a part of our population being unhealthy endangers the rest of our population um, for a variety of reasons. But but ethically, we cannot deny the type of, of well-being enhancing good that is out there like timely and periodic vaccinations to people. And so they're merit goods and, and, and we actually mandate these things. We mandate, because it's in society's interest, that a child has a set, a schedule of vaccinations and if that child does not have a set or a schedule of vaccinations, that child cannot participate in other public activities like public school. You don't get into school without showing your, your shot card. You don't get into college without showing your shot card. Um, and so we, we, we do. So they're, they're merit goods. They're things that the public sector um, is providing that the private sector, the mar a market could exist, but by excluding it would be intolerable. So that's what we, we get. So, so we've got these goods. We've got these goods, and I'm going to talk about them in a second. But I, I propose, so how do you value them? How do you value a public good? What's the worth of clean air? Well, that's a sticky little question. How, how, how valuable is, is clean air? And, and is it really clean or is it really dirty? I live in Iowa, and if you travel across to Iowa, you can smell some pretty obnoxious things. But that doesn't mean the air is dirty, just uncomfortable. There's a big difference. You may live in, a, in an area where there's, you don't smell anything, but you might have very dirty air. And it may be very harmful or harsh to you. Or you live in an area that's prone to temperature inversions. And you have high automobile and or, or commercial emissions. And you get smog alerts and, and, and ozone issues. Um, so how, how do we value that? Well, we don't trade on these goods. We don't trade them very well. And, and I propose that there are four methods that we use to directly evaluate the worth of public goods. Uh, the first thing that we use are elections. We biennially and quadrennially, we, we choose. We assess the value of a bundle of public goods, and we approve or disapprove of those costs associated with those goods. I talked in the last lecture about the ebb and flow of ideology and political focus on the kinds of rules and laws. And, and we're in a period in the 1970s where it's, we're expanding our regulatory authority. And then we move into a period in the 1980s where our regulatory authority becomes much more constrained, uh, I will argue strangled. And, and we use elections to express approval or disapproval um, of, of, of those bundles of public goods. We use referenda, and if you live in, in California, you know very well what referendums will do to you. And here the specific issue is put before the voters, um, not, not at the election in terms of by choosing your candidate, but directly um, you're choosing public policy by virtue of a, of a referendum. And they occur where the economic and political structure in a region are somewhat resistant to change. Um, we had the tax revolts of the late 1970s because people thought the taxing system, especially the property tax systems, were, 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 were onerous and they were destroying business competitiveness. And we get Proposition 19 in California, and, and that's just a mess, but that's California's problem. Um, we get other kinds of things over time that have nothing to do with private goods or merit goods or public goods. We get referendum on, on, on marriage. And people may argue that somehow or other they're, they're safeguarding society. Um, th that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kinds of, of referenda where you choose to mandate a certain kind of thing, whether, um, whether it's the provision of a public good or, or the elimination of some kind of exclusion. Courts, court decisions, these occur where de facto exclusions exist in society and politically we don't deal with them. Um, so these exclusions are evidence. Somebody is being, somebody is being excluded from access to something that they would be generally considered a good. Now, 
separate but equal in the civil rights legislation and or the slow foot dragging, foot dragging of the implementation of all of the civil rights reforms during the 50s, 60s, on into the 70s, you can have court decisions that mandate the provision of certain goods and, and, and to make sure that equal benefits are made available to people. And we've seen this in voting rights. We've seen this in, in, in busing to achieve desegregation in schools where there was a de facto segregation because people who had to live in poverty and or in certain areas historically, their systems did not allow for um, a desegregated um, opportunities at education, that there was still a separate and unequal system, even though those laws had been overturned. So the courts had to, to rule. Now, whether you agree with that or not, I don't really care. The courts do make decisions like that at times. Um, and then voting with our feet. And this is our good friend. It's called the Thibault, T-I-E-B-O-U-T, -E the Thibault Hypothesis. And it means that you and I choose the appropriate mix of public goods and services um, based on, 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 on our perceived benefits and, and, and the cost of receiving those benefits. So where we live is a measure of our preference for a bundle of public goods and the costs of those goods. Now, you can imagine, you can imagine an older person whose children are grown, um, really not wanting to live in a community that was really child friendly, that had lots of parks and water slides and was spending lots of money on, on family friendly stuff, but really not very attentive perhaps to the needs of an older population. You could see um, a, a family not wanting to live in a community that had nothing but the bare bones public services, uh, you know, just a minimal level of, of public goods and public education and no parks, but was incredibly business friendly and did everything it could to encourage more business growth and it had lots of traffic and everything like that, that but that didn't seem very welcoming to a family. You can see, well, people make choices like that. You could argue that the entire suburbanization movement was at a burgeoning and emerging middle class in the 50s, 60s, 70s, on into now, making a choice with their feet to live in a different setting given what they may have had a choice of. Like, you may be working within the city, but a city is dark, dirty, and, and has crime and all kinds of things that we associate with a city. And you may say, no, the things that I value are more suburban in nature, lower stress, larger houses, green lawns, um, two-car garage, that might be. But that changes over time. And we've seen in recent years people moving back in and opting for efficiencies and opportunities and, and amenities associated with central city living. And so they're voting with their feet. And they buy a mix of goods and services that's appropriate to their needs and it's appropriate to their abilities to pay. So we do, we do value this, this stuff um, explicitly, directly, um, but it's not traded in the market. Okay, I want to go to externalities. And I'm going to finish up with externalities in this lecture before I move on to uh, uh, introducing the next discussion where I'm going to talk about um, a decline of uh, natural monopolies, but an externality is a very important thing in in our um, economy, and an externality is where the benefits and costs to my private decisions, um, where there are benefits and costs to my private decisions, that are not reflected in the prices that I'm paying for a good or a service. Generally, it is a benefit or cost of a market transaction that is not reflected in that market transaction and is not explicitly incorporated into that market demand or market supply curve. Easy things. If, here's, a, here's a positive externality. Let's say that I, I live in a so-so neighborhood, uh, but I'm kind of a fussy guy and I move in, I buy this house and the first thing I do is I paint that house and I put on nice little shutters and I landscape it and I, and I make my little house on the corner the neighborhood's model home. It's beautiful. It's great. It's making everybody look bad. 
Well, maybe not so, because, because my house looks good, it reflects favorably on the neighborhood. And my neighborhood's value is perceived to be higher based on, on, on my. So I've, I've made a benefit to the neighborhood by my fussiness, by my wanting to have a very nice little house. Um, so that's one kind of, of benefit. It can be pecuniary. We could also have another one. If, if, uh, uh, if somebody over-consumed a commodity like electricity or, or something, Remember, if, we, if, we, if we're consuming too much of something and the supply is limited or fixed or you can't increase supply very fast or very efficiently, then it drives up the price. And let's say there's a portion of society that overconsumes gasoline and, and I drive a Prius. And there's a portion of, cons of society that, that overconsumes electricity and every one of my house's appliances is an energy star appliance and all of my lights are fluorescent and I hardly use any energy at all. But all of these people out there, they demand, demand, demand and it keeps the price up even though I'm an efficient small unit user. I'm, I'm, I'm paying for that so it's not a benefit to me. Well, that's all fine and good but what I really care about are what are called real real externalities, where something increases my real costs, um, and, and, but it's caused by something else. The most common one is pollution, or somebody not incorporating all of the costs of production into the prices, the, the commodity that they're selling. The easiest way to think of it, let's imagine that I'm producing a widget, but in producing a widget, I'm able to emit a very high amount of emissions into the air and a very high amount of, of effluent directly into the waterways. I'm polluting the air and I'm polluting the waterways. Well, society pays for dirty air and society pays for dirty water in that it either has to clean up the air or live with lower health or it has to clean up the water or spend more money to make the water so that we can drink it downstream or the water gets polluted and it, it takes away from that bundle of amenities that we love like fishing and, and being able to swim and go to the beach and things like that. Well, all of those costs of production aren't reflected in that business's uh, production costs and the price that we pay for that good. And as a consequence, um, we're paying less than we should be or to put it differently, the, pro the product or the commodity isn't priced properly. And if it's not priced properly, if it's priced too low, we're over consuming something. Now you can make the case about anything that has a significant environmental consequence, whether it's gasoline or coal-fired electric plants, things that have emissions that we know are harmful and they're not being priced properly because we're socializing the costs and they're, they're not being reflected in the prices that we have to pay. So that's what happens with an externality. And I'm going to stop here and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a graph of what happens when you have an externality and, and you shift the, the cost or the burden of the externality to the producer. What does that do to society? This is the end of, of uh, session three and I'll be back in a little bit with session four. <laughs>